Coming up on episode 40 of Omnivore, weighing the pros and cons of in-house food manufacturing, playing to win in a disruptive food environment, and a multidisciplinary approach to new product development. This is Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Almond Board of California. Almonds offer endless possibilities for innovation. Visit almonds.com slash trends to learn more. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. While some small and mid-sized food and beverage companies choose to outsource their product manufacturing to co-packers, others strategically opt to keep the process in-house, driven by a range of factors including cost efficiency, process challenges, technology implementation, and quality control. Food Technologies Kelly Hensel recently chatted with Julie Smolansky, the president and CEO of LifeWave Foods, about the decision to keep manufacturing in-house after her father, a mechanical engineer, started the company in 1986. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Julie. I wanted to start out by talking about um, your tenure as president and CEO of Lifeway Foods. I know you've been in uh, in that role since 2002. And I was wondering how has the the company's approach to manufacturing changed during your tenure, especially with the acquisitions of Fresh Made Dairy in 2009 and Glen Oak Farms in 2021? Well, thank you so much for having me. I would say for the most part, it's it's largely stayed the same. My father was a, a mechanical engineer when we started in 1986 when he launched the company. Unlike many others, he took on manufacturing on his own, starting with one tank and then building to five tanks and then 10 and now, you know, tanks and facilities and multi-states. And he believed that it was better to be in control of your own destiny. And I think that that largely has been true and has given us uh, an upper hand in the marketplace and with competition um, and has provided the best possible uh, customer service for our retail partners and distributors and provided the most consistent product, highest quality product, and something that we are really proud of for the last almost four decades now. How has it evolved with the acquisition of Fresh Made and Glen Oak? So Fresh Made is a smaller brand that we acquired on the East Coast, and Glen Oaks is a brand that we acquired on the West Coast. In the, the East Coast situation, so we have some manufacturing facilities now on the East, which helps us with um, logistics and reducing costs and time um, for getting product on the East Coast. And since we're nationwide and even international, it's helpful now that we have manufacturing in different parts of the country, um, especially because gas is so high these days and it fluctuates and we just never know. So it's always great to get closer to the customer, closer to the end user. And that that helps on days for um, shelf life as well as cost on the product. Doing our own internal manufacturing worked for us. Maybe it's you know not right for everybody. And I think ultimately it's a barrier to entry for other um, other potential brands that might want to come in and compete. Sure. Um, they're going to have to have a really big overhead in figuring out operations, manufacturing. And, and how to, you know, and then and the cost of doing that. And, you know, if you're going to be outsourcing that, I promise you that you are not going to be a priority for anybody <laughs> else. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to take their customers that are larger, that they have more time and loyalty to um, than a new startup. So that's going to be a barrier. The cost is going to be incredibly high. Um, so your margins are going to be thin. Um, if you will evil, even able to break even, there's a lot of barriers to outsourcing your manufacturing um, and limitations. And the same goes to doing it in-house. So, 
you know, yeah. you have to pick your heart, choose your heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, you know, you mentioned destiny a couple of times in there. I think you're right. Like one of the main benefits is having that control over, over which products, how many, you know, what your run is, um, how quickly you're able to fulfill and maybe try out new products. I don't know how, how that's, yeah. um, yeah, how, if you, if you would like to talk about that a little, I'd be interested to hear how it's enabled you guys to like pivot or try different things. You know, doing all of our own internal manufacturing gives us the ability to be quick and nimble and respond to um, market demands pretty much instantly. Uh, we have a line of new SKUs. We, we developed them in record time. And I can just promise you, I just know, had we been dependent and reliant on an outsourced manufacturing process, it would have probably taken us two years to launch a, a you know new SKUs. Um, it's just things move at record at, at record slow paces. Um, like I said, you're not a priority to anybody else except for yourself. Yeah. Um, I just you know, and and the times that we have had to work with outside co-packers for other products, for example, we did a, a line of frozen kefir, like kefir mm -hmm. ice cream type concept. Mm -hmm. So we would make the base internally at, at Lifeway. Okay. And then we would send the base over to a, a company to be able to go through the freezing process and packing process, because that was something we didn't have. Like in that situation, the minimums were so big. We were just burning through so much product that we didn't need versus if we were running it all in that in internal, um, we might've had uh, a little bit more control over smaller runs or yeah. whatever, but on a new product, something that you don't know if it's going to work or not, you know, we, we weren't in the place where we were going to invest in a freezing process, right? right and yeah. Freezers and, you know, fr freezing machines and, um, you know, that, that whole process. So, we wanted to see if it would have proof of concept before we would have invested in something. But I think that's important, you know, when you're just starting out and playing with something new, you know, before you do make that large, large investment, it's sure. important to see if there's proof of concept. And so maybe you would make the decision that, okay, we'll burn through some product and, you know, have to just, you know, lose a little bit in the beginning on a particular line before we make the decision that it's worth it for us to either bring it in house or or do something else with it. But, um, you know, those are some things that each company, each entrepreneur, each brand, each product line, you have to really kind of analyze and see where it makes sense to um, go ahead and, you know, maybe take some losses for yeah. for some proof of concept or bring it in house right away. I mean, it's, it's hard decisions to, to make, but I will say that I think ultimately my father's decision almost 40 years ago to do our own manufacturing is the reason why Lifeway today is in such a strong place. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, am you know, really grateful that he did that. So right now it's really important to us. It's a priority to scale our capacity to scale our operations, to create efficiencies, to bring the cost of our product down, knowing that inflation is something that we're all having to deal with. All right. So as you work to take advantage of the consumer's interest in kefir and grow and expand distribution, are there plans to expand the capacity at your current facilities or even open up new ones? I was wondering just what the game plan is for Lifeway Foods. We are absolutely working on various facility improvements, mm -hmm. um, things that support manufacturing efficiencies, safety, and just productivity overall. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we are looking at scaling all the various infrastructure within the business. And as we continue to grow, we continue to modernize our facilities, improve our internal efficiencies, repair older machines. but yeah, um, you know, uh, really the demand for Kiefer and Lifeway products is so incredibly strong right now um, that we have a lot of wind at our back and we are looking at increasing the production capacity that we have internally rather rapidly. 
you know, our children's pro bugs, for example, we had um, three slow moving early, early stage machines, the first generation pouching machines Mm -hmm. when they first came out. Um, Now, now it's been probably almost 15 years. Um, (laughs) And we just we just uh, went through a machine expansion. So um, purchased a new machine that's coming online now, which is giving us the ability to expand our pro bugs line and um, again, create more efficiencies, keep the product pricing under control. So, you know, in some cases we might not have to raise the prices because of the efficiencies that we've created. The margins are good enough, strong enough for us to keep the prices as is, but just internally create better product efficiencies, production efficiencies. Thank you so much, Julie, for taking the time to talk to me today. This has been really enlightening and I think it's going to give a lot of companies, especially some new entrepreneurs out there, some food for thought. Julie Smolanski has been president and CEO of dairy products manufacturer Lifeway Foods since 2002. Read more about the strategic reasons food and beverage companies choose to do their own production in the July issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Almond Board of California. Almonds offer endless possibilities for innovation. To help you stay ahead of the curve, Almond Board partnered with TasteWise, a generative AI platform for modern food and beverage brands to identify shifts that will help shape the future of snacking and beyond. Get inspired and learn more by visiting almonds.com slash trends. Again, that's visiting almonds.com slash trends. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. The packaged food sector is facing its share of challenges right now, ranging from consumer frustration over food price inflation to the market disrupting impact of Ozempic and other emerging weight loss drugs. As global lead for food and agriculture at strategy consultancy Carney, Rob Dungoski spends a lot of his time thinking about how to navigate issues like these. He recently shared some signposts for food companies to find the best path forward with Food Technologies' Mary Ellen Kuhn. Thanks for joining today, Rob. It's been 30 years since Americans have spent as much of their total income on food as they are today, so consumers aren't happy. How serious is this situation in terms of impact on the food industry, and how should food companies be responding? Yeah, thanks, Marilyn. So always a pleasure to speak with you. The, um, I mean, I think the reality is, you know, we've enjoyed a very low percentage of our um, disposable income spent on food for quite a long time, and so there's just things that are changing. And I think it's not just the, you know, we can look at food inflation as one factor, and you know, are we going to see these prices sustained? But I, I think it's also some other factors around more shift towards healthier food, uh, fewer ingredients, fresh, local, those kinds of things that are you know, really incenting people to spend more money on their food because they see them as a much more important part of their diet and and their overall health. So, and even if you look at generational aspects, you know, the you know the the cheap and convenient food that boomers and Xers you know enjoyed so much, I think the millennials and Gen Zs have a, a different attitude about that food. Well, we'll get back to some of those topics because it's really interesting. But I did want to stay on prices for a minute and the impact of inflation, because I've seen at least one major food company CEO quoted as saying that consumers will adjust. It may be begrudgingly, but they will adjust. So I want to establish if you agree with that, or is the industry at a tipping point where it might be necessary to course correct a little bit in order to maintain consumer loyalty to branded products? I I think the bigger issue around the branded products is you know, is that what consumers want? Is are, are the portfolios fit for the future? So price is one thing, you know, we've heard shrinkflation, we've heard all the terms that everyone worked through the managed, managed cost. But I think it's more of a question of, of what's the brand look like in the future? And if you think about grocery today, 99% of consumers' decisions are made at the shelf. You know, you walk in and say, I want peanut butter, and you pick it out when you get there. You know, when you move to an online channel, now all of a sudden you're picking exact brands. And then you're also offering someone that is not you to, to make substitutes if that's what's needed. So I think, how do you create stickiness in the brands when you shift more towards online, you know, dark store environments? 
you know, how's that going to redirect potential trade trade promotion dollars as well? So I think it's more than just, um, you know, just, you know, prices. I think it's a lot about the, what we talked about earlier around, around health, moving to fewer ingredients, but also, you know, what does a brand mean going forward as well? Kind of in that vein then, um, let's talk about some of those other challenges uh, in addition like to online. Consumers are really worried about processed foods and ultra processed foods and brand loyalty isn't really what it used to be. So if you're the CEO of a major CPG company, what's the biggest concern that's keeping you up at night? Yeah, I, I think the, if I'm, a, if I'm a big CEO, what's keeping me up at night is, is really two things. One is, do I have a portfolio that is really fit for purpose going forward? Is it a portfolio that consumers want? And, you know, a lot of the consumers are really asking for fewer ingredients. They want to know what those ingredients are. They want to know where they came from, how was food treated. So I think the first question is around my portfolio. Is it fit for the future? And the second question is for the, the brands that I want to, I want to keep, um, can I, you know, can I realistically shift them into a, a mode that that fits consumers' desires. If consumers want five ingredients or less, and my some of my big brands have twenty ingredients, and some of those are are uh, synthetics, you know, how, how do I shift that portfolio? Is that realistic? Can I find, you know, reformulate those ingredients? Can I repackage? Can I resize those? I, so those are the two things that I think about on a, on a you know uh, top of mind basis. Talking about the whole health issue, your column in Food Tech brought up the topic of the appetite-suppressing GLP-1 drugs as an example of a market-disrupting development that we've seen this year. So how do you think the food industry is doing in terms of its response to this development? I think in general, it was, you know, the, the food system overall, I think, was a little caught by surprise. And I think some are doing better than others. Some have reacted quicker. Um, they've, they've really jumped on it. But I think ultimately... When, when this hit the scene, the question was, is this just a fad or is this a trend? And I think we've gone long enough through the cycle now to say, it's not just a fad. This is an actual trend. And once it's a trend, now you start you know, thinking about how do I reformulate? How do I reposition my brands? You know, what's my packaging look like? So it appeals to this consumer who's looking for, for, these, uh, uh, for these types of food products. So I think we've reached a point now we're past the fad stage. We're moving into trends. And I think we'll see more and more folks start to... Uh, uh, to align accordingly. Well, you've also spoken about the importance of being aware of impacts that come from outside the food system, which is, is obviously an example of that. But what processes should food companies have in place to help them monitor and be prepared for these impacts? Yeah, I think there's always improvement to think outside. I think a lot of companies you know, in the food system can get really insulated. You know, They think only about their four walls, what happens inside our four walls. Maybe we look at our competitors but are we looking at necessarily our suppliers and our supplier supplier? Are we looking at our customers and our customers customer? So I think they're starting to see that extend. Now I think when you think about some potential influences outside the food system, that challenge just got even bigger because now you got to think about which systems could potentially impact food. And I think there's really two. I think it's health and I think it's energy. You know, so when I look at health and I think about terms, you know, Things that could potentially change in the in the healthcare arena that if you start to see incentives for, for consumers for better health, if it's going to affect their health premium or what they pay for healthcare overall, how do I contribute and jump into that as a food uh, as a food system? In the energy space, if we're going to see incentives for sustainable aviation fuel and things like that, then you know how am I going to jump in if I'm a if I'm a big ag company and make sure I'm I'm riding that wave on the energy cycle as well? So I think it's. The challenge is always look outside your four walls, but I think in this case, you got to look even further outside your four walls than uh, maybe what a lot of companies are thinking about today. So really big picture. Well, well, for the food scientists among our listeners, could you share any thoughts about how food system disruption and big picture issues may be changing their careers and how they should prepare for that? Yeah, I think if you think of all the changes we've talked about, you know, whether it's trending towards healthier foods, food or fewer ingredients, I think food scientists have got a tremendous role to play in the future. You know, I mean, their their job is is probably going to change uh, for for a lot of good good reasons. But I think they're going to play a pivotal role as we think about the future food system. So, you know, one is I think about the role of science and technology t today versus what could look like in the future. Think about ten years down the ro the road. What's Gen AI? What's CRISPR? You know, what are these kinds of technologies going to mean as we are a food scientist? And then I think about even on a short term basis. You know, we've seen big outages, big cost increases for things like vanilla and cocoa. And so I think, you know, having 
food scientists now start to think about how do I help my, you know, my uh, product managers, how do I help them control costs and find, you know, sub- substitutes for key ingredients is a, is a big key. And I think the last thing that, you know, as we start to trend towards this, this movement towards natural ingredients, you know, so we're, we're looking at colorings and flavorings and textures that are all natural, you know, that's what consumers are asking for. And so when they flip that package over, they're going to see, you know, uh, ingredients they recognize, not science sounding names. And I think our food scientists are going to play a huge role in that. Well, that's exciting. So just to wrap things up, where do you and the team at Carney see the greatest growth opportunities for the packaged foods industry? You've touched on some of it, but maybe you could recap that a little bit. Yeah, I think growth is going to come from a variety of things. We're still going to be thinking about customer segments and personas and occasions and all those kinds of things. But I think healthy brands, I think, has a lot of staying power. You know, I mean, if we shift from group insurance to individually priced insurance policies and you're incented to share your your health data, your nutrition data. I mean, that, that could be rocket fuel for, uh, for for healthy brands. I think that what I mentioned earlier around fewer ingredients, I think if you put a food on the shelf today, less than five ingredients, make sure you can pronounce them all. Make sure it's something consumers can you know recognize right away. I think the the ability to provide visibility and transparency and even traceability to to the ingredients. So I can say, this is where it came from. This is the the uh, the treatment this, this certain ingredient was uh, what was provided, you know, did, did you use pesticides? Did you use these chemicals? You know, if you get in the animal space, did you, are you using good animal welfare tactics? Those, those kinds of things are, are really important. And I think the last area for growth is really around ethnic foods. You know, when you think nearly 60% of Gen Z's millennials will have a Hispanic meal every single week, you know, and they're fusing, you know, Hispanic meals with Asian meals. And so I think that whole area of ethnic food and 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 what that could bring to bear is also just a, a great growth opportunity for for packaged food rob thanks so much for sharing your insights today i should say mary Ellen, thank you for having me always a pleasure to speak with you and and uh, to share conversations so thank you for the opportunity rob dagoski leads the food and agriculture sector at consultancy carney check out the july issue of food technology to read his take on how companies can play to win in the food system of the future. So far, 2024 has already been a big year for food product launches, with a debut of everything from cauliflower-based snack puffs and sustainably sourced gluten-free ice creams to high-protein cereals and plant protein cookie mixes. But the journey from concept to a successful product launch is complex, requiring a delicate multidisciplinary blend of creativity, sound science, and meticulous attention to detail. Julie Larson Brisher caught up with food scientists Karthik Sajid Babu and Karthik Shaw of Sargento Foods to discuss how product developers can discover successful formulations that not only meet market demands, but also delight consumers. Hi, Karthik and Kardik. Welcome back to Omnimore. Hi, Julie. Thank you very much. Hey, Julie. Thank you for having us. Well, let's start with you, Karthik. I, I think one of the most exciting aspects of food formulation is the creative side. That very first step, right, of coming up with the idea for a new product or improving a, an existing one with some sort of twist. Um, what techniques do product developers use to generate ideas? and How important is it to consider consumer trends or other market insights um, when you're dreaming up a new item? And and do you have any examples from your own experience? Absolutely, Julie. Uh, The creative aspect of food formulation uh, is is, is quite thrilling. Uh, Product developers, you know, they have like variety of techniques uh, they use. Uh, Depends on each company too. You know, one company might have a certain approach and like other company, you know, might uh, have a different approach. So the five key things uh, for me would be to, uh, the first one being like brainstorming sessions. So it's key to actually get together, you know, your team uh, and that collaborative sessions to start with. So that actually brings out like a lot of ideas, like, you know, within the team. Uh, The second thing would be trend analysis. So this could be either the insights team from the company, you you know, they could do this for us or we could outsource it and get the trend of, you know, what product, you know, we have to uh, develop. And the next thing would be consumer feedback. 
So this is like engaging the consumers through surveys and focus groups. That way we get the right feedback from the consumers. Uh, and the next thing, next thing would be competitive analysis. Uh, it's always key to watch out for uh, what uh, the competitor is doing and you know what samples they have out there. So that's, that would be my fourth point. And my fifth thing would be uh, innovation workshops. So getting the team together, you know, from within your company or, you know, collaborating with other scientists, you know, let's say from other universities uh, and, you know, uh, getting those creative, uh, innovative workshops together. Those would be my, you know, key five things for product development. And uh, as you asked, like an example, yeah, you know, uh, which I had from the past. So we were trying to develop this uh, uh, plan based product. Uh, you know, there is a lot of like craze going about going beyond uh, for the plan based products. Uh, but it's always uh, key to, you know, put together a team, like, you know, look out for what's in the market and use the right ingredients and, you know, to do the uh, right studies, like whether it is like based on texture or, uh, you know, any challenge studies, like, you know, uh, for having the right product. Oh, that sounds fantastic. You know, whenever I'm in the grocery store, I'm amazed by the amount of new products that I see from week to week or even month to month. Um, what kind of plant-based product was that? Yeah, it was an exciting product. So, you know, we made this out of like different, uh, mixing bunch of like legumes and like grains in it. Uh, the key thing was like the texture uh, throughout the shelf life. You know, we could make something always, you know, which looks good on the label and like the nutritional, but it's hard to uh, get other quality standpoints, like, you know, the texture of it, the specific flavor we are, you know, looking for. So, yeah, once we do the good ideation process along with market research and, uh, you know, feedbacks from consumer through focus groups and all that, like, yeah, we can pretty sure create any product. Uh, but, you know, there are certain things that goes into it, you know, for a successful launch. Yeah, yeah. And I'll address uh, Cardic now. Um, in your recent article that you wrote for Food Technology, um, <clears throat> it was called Unlocking the Keys to Successful Formulation. Uh, you noted that ideation is just the first step, right, T toward the outcome of a successful overall formulation process. Um, can you highlight some of the others? And does the developer need to factor in all of these into the formulation process all at once up front? Or, or is it a process that's more drawn mm -hmm. out? Yes, um, thank you, Julie. Um, as you mentioned, ideation is just a starting point and every project is different. Um, it can happen all at once or concurrently or it can follow you know, the process. So for example, some of the key steps following ideation could include ingredients, in ingredient selection, prototyping, sensor evaluation, testing and validation, regulatory compliance, scale up, quality control, just, just to name a few. And those can happen concurrently or sequentially as well, depending on the project and the organization as well. Now, let's uh, use an example for a snack bar. Now, we won't be able to cover all aspects, um, but let's try to understand just a couple of stages or steps for developing and launching a new snack bar. In, in formulating a new snack bar, after brainstorming the initial concept, the first step would be selecting the right ingredients to ensure the desired taste, texture, and nutritional value. Next, extensive R&D is conducted to study these ingredients and their interaction. Following that, prototyping involves um, creating initial version of the snack bar, which are then subjected to sensory evaluation to evaluate taste, texture, and overall consumer appeal. Now, Creating something is just the first piece of the puzzle. You would want to make sure that all, that the products meet all the safety and quality standards before it reaches to the market. And hence, rigorous testing and validation are also conducted to ensure that the product meets all the safety and quality standards. Regulatory compliance is equally important to ensure that the product adheres to all legal standards, which might involve nutritional labeling and claims verification. Quality control measures are also implemented to ensure each batch of the product meets the required standards. And package, packaging design is also a critical step involving the selection of materials that protect the snack bar and enhance its shelf life while also appealing to consumers. Overall, a comprehensive marketing strategy is formulated as well to position the product in the market, followed by distribution planning to ensure the product reaches retailers and consumers efficiently. Now, all that being said, the developers don't need to dwell into each and every details up front, as you mentioned. 
having a strategic overview of the entire process of anticipate challenges, allocate resources efficiently, and mitigate any risks early on, which ultimately enhances the chances of successful formulation. Well, um, Karthik, in your opinion, what is the one area that's the biggest pitfall in this multidisciplinary process? And what can the product developer do to effectively d- address it? Yeah, Julie, thank you. Good question, actually. Uh, so one of the biggest pitfall, uh, you know, as we talked a little about like selecting the right ingredients, right? So uh, yeah, it's always key to like select the right ingredients for the right product and, you know, to source it accordingly. Uh, and the other part which product developers, you know, always uh, sometimes they do is like overlooking the product shelf life. Uh, so that is also, you know, not not a good thing to do. You know, sometimes uh, accelerated, there are like different techniques, you know, you can uh, uh, employ actually to find out like the shelf life of a product. You could do like, you know, accelerated shelf life testing. You could do like challenge studies. And you could also actually store the product that, you know, let's say if you want a 100-day shelf life, store it at that point, you know, until that point at the right uh, temperature, humidity, and, you know, study it that way. So sometimes I have seen like the developers like overlook the product shelf life and, you know, that leads to other issues. So uh, to address the issue, like, you know, we will uh, actually have to have things in place to uh, correctly study the shelf life of a product. You know, this could be either to uh, through challenge studies, like, you know, where you can do like an inactivation type of challenge testing, or you could do some, you know, growth inhibition uh, challenge testing, uh, or, you know, any any other techniques, you know, you could actually employ to uh, rightly study the shelf life of a product. Uh, that's that's a, a key thing uh, as a, you know, being a developer. Uh, and, and it's also key to sort of like, you know, take that knowledge and like communicate with, with the other uh, members of the team, like, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, folks from marketing or, uh, you know, sales, like, you know, everybody has, has to be on the, on the same page and folks from quality too, like our, our food safety. Uh, so I see like product developer, uh, you know, being, uh, being, being that person uh, where, you know, they keep like everybody like, you know, sort of on the same page and trying to do the right things. So that you not only meet the deadlines, you know, to launch a product, but then you also have a product, you know, that is like, you know, stable in terms of like quality, safety and like, you know, uh, everything else. So, uh, so those are uh, some of the uh, key points. And to me, like being proactive and, you know, to reaching out to folks in your team and like, you know, if you have to work with uh, other people, like, you know, you feel free to always like reach out and be proactive in, you know, solving those issues. Uh, then sort of like realizing, you know, once we have a final product, hey, we need to tweak these things to, you know, do something different. So it's always good to be proactive, like, you know, uh, being a product developer. Yeah. And so far we've been talking, it's been a very people forward process, very collaborative, mm-hmm. um, working with the others on mm-hmm. sort of mapping out this process so that you do get that successful outcome. But I'm going to I'm turning to Kartik now um, because I think another fascinating aspect today in today's R&D environment is how technology is being leveraged during the formulation process. Um, How does that fit into the product developers toolkit, you know, when formulating a new or enhanced product? It's a very interesting topic, isn't it? All the novel technologies, machine learning and AI. So I can I can try to answer that. So advanced tools and technologies have become very much of an integral part of a product developer's toolkit. For example, computational modeling and simulation can predict how different ingredients will interact with each other, which significantly speeds up the initial phases of formulation. Similarly, High throughput screening allows R&D developers to quickly test a large number of formulation for key attributes, such as stability and performance. Talk about AI and machine learning. Artificial intelligence and machine learning can analyze vast data sets to identify patterns and optimize formulation based on the desired outcomes, such as taste, texture, nutritional profile, and food products. Technology has transcended into other areas of product development as well. For example, um, digital sensory analysis provides objective data on taste, aroma, and texture. Not only that, smart packaging solution, which includes sensors and indicators, help monitor products, freshness, and quality throughout the supply chain. Regulatory compliance is also streamlined with software that ensures all labeling and health claims meet the current standards. And finally, 
technology supports marketing strategy formulation and distribution planning through data analytics and supply chain management systems, ensuring efficient market entry and product delivery. Incorporating all these technologies not only accelerate the formulation process, but also improves the precision, efficiency, and success rate of developing new and enhanced products. Yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting time, I think, to be a product developer. Well, I want to thank you guys again, uh, both Karthik and Kartik, uh, for being on Omnivore. Thank you, Julie. Happy to contribute. Thank you, Julie. Always, uh, we love chatting with you, and yeah, it was a great topic to talk talk about. Thank you. Karthik Sajit Babu is a senior research scientist, and Kartik Shaw is a technology principal with Sargento Foods. Both are active members of IFT's product development division. You can find their article, Unlocking Secrets to Successful Formulation, in the July issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, Almond Board of California. Get inspired and learn more by visiting almonds.com slash trends. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine, or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.